Hi there, it's Kevin Raber, and I'm excited today to bring you a behind the scenes look at a new product being developed by my friend Hugh Brownstone and his partner, Ed Palasak. Essentially, it's called the Helium 3 Anti-Theft Camera Grip. Now, you think, who can design a new camera grip? There's lots of them out there. Well, these guys have taken it a bit further, and it's really something to take a look at. And we're going behind the scenes today to look at how this product was designed, made, and it's now ready to order. Take a look. It's Kevin Raber here, and uh, <laughs> going to have a fun time today. We're back online with Hugh Brownstone, and uh, he's been working on a pretty incredible project. Uh, and I always admire uh, photographers and friends that uh, innovate and invent and uh, tr try to improve on things that are out there or things that were never existed that we all wished we kind of had at one point. And Hugh, uh, with his friend Ed, and we'll introduce Ed here in a second, and, and Hugh, because we're going to let them talk a little bit about their cool project, uh, went out and looked at making a grip for cameras, uh, a grip that was going to prevent cameras from being stolen, being a grip that allowed you to find your camera if it, if it was misplaced, uh, and uh, then do it in an ergonomic fashion that was just had a factor of cool added to it. So Hugh, tell me a little bit about this and uh, introduce Ed and let's, let's talk a little how you got into this. Well, so first I have to introduce you to my partner and my dear friend, Ed Palasok. Um, we both have Leica Q3s. We're both avid photographers. He's a wonderful photographer in his own right. But uh, we we found each other online, and it wasn't through Harmony.com or Chemistry.com. It was actually when Ed reached out uh, to have a portfolio review, which ended up being this crazy great one-hour session, basically about one photograph. And every now and again, you realize you have met someone who is just an extraordinary human being. And Ed, I don't mean to make you blush, Ed, but <laughs> you know how you know how I feel about you. I think he's he's brilliant. He has uh, the kind of intellectual humility that only really bright and emotionally intelligent people can have. And we just have so much fun together. Uh, he eventually came to one of our workshops and, uh, what happened was, uh, we started just noodling products. Ed is an architect. He'll tell you all about that. A registered architect for decades. He's, uh, wonderfully into industrial design. We both are, but he's also this incredible 3d modeler that, that comes from his background. And I don't mean to take anything away from it. He'll, he'll cover that in a moment. But the uh, first product that we were just fooling around with, there was no intention of, of making it real, was a, a teleprompter because I could not find a teleprompter that I liked. And actually, the teleprompter that I use is one that we designed together. Uh, there were other things that Ed designed, and we looked at that. But then when the Q3 came along, I, I love the Q3. It's amazing. Like is amazing. I got the grip, of course. The grip is amazing. And yet the grip was not what I needed, what I wanted. And Ed, being Ed, said, let's start playing. And we did. And uh, I, I will save a lot of this for Ed. I don't mean to monopolize the conversation. But we, we work incredibly well collaboratively. And this thing took on a life of its own. And over dozens and dozens of hours doing FaceTime and interactive modeling in real time, we came up with a grip that we liked so much that we made ones for our own cameras. And then we said, we have to bring this to market. That's, that's it in a nutshell. So this is, uh, the, uh, the grip has a, a plate on it for Arca Swiss, uh, tripod mounts. It's got the ability where you have cutouts for the battery compartment and all sorts of things. Obviously a lot of design went into it. So maybe, Ed can highlight that a little bit and, and talk a little bit about the features and how you design those into the, the product. Sure, sure. I, it, it's interesting that when along that journey, when uh, Hugh and I met, we should start with 
it started a little bit before that when I was going through a little bit of a journey of trying to find the right travel camera because I came from a background of 5D, big Canon. Uh, I've had a Canon A1 as my first Canon when I was a teenager and my, my wonderful grandmother, bless her soul, um, was passionate about art and was very supportive of my interests. And I still have that and I, it's a wonderful camera. But having kids, having cameras, taking pictures, you get to the point when you realize this is just so much of a burden just to want to take images and captures. And so when my daughter went travel abroad to Spain, it was the opportunity of saying, well, I don't want to lug 50 pounds of equipment. I've got to take a different approach because my wife's not going to want to deal with me, stopping, unloading, setting up, taking pictures. And I don't want to do it. I really want to streamline the whole experience. And so I had reached out to a friend of mine, uh, Noel Kleinman, who's out in California, who's a real estate photographer. And I reached out to him for some of his, uh, his ideas of what I should get. And he immediately said, get the Fuji X100. And I was like, okay, that sounds great. He says it's a fixed lens, but that's okay. It's great. It's light. It's the only camera you'll need. And it's fantastic for traveling. And so I went down that rabbit hole. And of course, as we all know, the, the one, X100 5 was non-existent. You couldn't get one. No one was probably ever going to get one. So then I was searching for a fallback and ended up with the X-T5. That was actually a great camera for our trip to Spain. And it reinvigorated my passion for photography, which had been somewhat on the simmer side for a long time, uh, busy with life and, and kids. And so the trip really invigorated me get back into the, the deep passions of composition and what's in the frame. And when I was talking about my experiences doing street photography, he said, you've got to see this one guy's um, video. He's phenomenal. He's right in line with the way you think. You, you're just going to love what you see. And he, that's when he turned me on to Hughes, uh, Three Blind Men and, uh, and an Elephant um, episodes, which I locked in and immediately was enamored by his method of delivery and his message and not talking about gear, but talking about the philosophy of, of photography. And I think at one point, I forget it was the, the Salter uh, episode you had done. I reached out and said, I, I've got to talk to him. I've got a picture. I've just been just dwelling over. I'm not quite sure. I love it, but I don't know if I love it. And there's something in it I just need to extract. And I said, I'm going to sign up. And I, as you pointed out, I set up for a portfolio review. And we went over that one image, which just, it was like talking to a brother. It was just <laughs> easy. It was extremely constructive. And it was somewhat defining in a way. Because after that, I signed up for... Uh, Hughes New York uh, City workshop and uh, I think it, things kind of took off from there about a month before that workshop though I think you you did the review for the Q3 and the way you had put it together fell right in place with my experiences I was having with photography equipment and traveling and what is the idea what is really ideal what am I really looking for what do I really need versus what I think I would need. And the way you had summed it up, it just resonated to the degree. I said, I've got to get that camera. So of course I was trying to get that camera, which is, was very hard to get as it, as it was. Was and that the Fuji or the Leica? The Leica Q3 was equally difficult to find at the time. This was back October last year. Mm -hmm. Two days before the trip to, to Hughes workshop, I came across one. And I managed to get it. And Hughes Workshop was the first time I got to use that camera. And it was a mind melt. The camera was perfect. It was just like an extension of just my eyes, my everything, my thinking. Cool. And so that was a bit of an epiphany to have gone on the workshop, going through one of Hughes uh, workshops, meeting all the wonderful people that I did, and having that camera. It just came together as a is a perfect storm of events. And uh, it was interesting coming from a different point because it, 
I was using the peak capture clip and I had their base attachment on the bottom. And so I was working using the camera in the field the way I would use it. And he had his equipment, everyone was having different kinds of equipment. So it was interesting to see how the choices of implementing equipment in the field on the street varied among different people. And I think that's when we started talking a little bit about some of the limitations, some of the you know, subconscious aggravations of the things that we have to put up with when you get into some of these cameras that for one reason or another are designed around things that aren't necessarily the in the spirit of supporting the actual use in the field. And it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing because there is a difference between uh product management and being a practitioner and this is something that leaves me always in trying desperately to get out of the futz zone and that's really uh, essential to what we were doing because we were because we are photographers we see things a little bit differently and we felt every single pain point there there was to feel and that's when we started to have fun because it was hey what if i stop being a reviewer long enough to put my money where my mouth is and what if ed had the opportunity to really just go whole hog into industrial design if just in a little narrow way because he has a very successful architectural practice and yeah that's so you, that's how it's off so you, you designed a grip but did you feel that the camera wasn't comfortable or that the grip was needed what what why did you decide you needed something to, to go there i mean you know you can buy a base plate and put a base plate on and uh you know leica has their own grip what was it that drove you to thinking how to make something better what is it, 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 go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. well I, from, from from my perspective it was that I had uh, an approach to holding the camera because remember for street photography, yep. we're going around for hours and hours and hours. And so we want to travel really light. Even a few ounces can make a big difference on a shoulder around the neck. And I developed what I called the tefillin grip, which is you'd have my uh, neck strap and I'd wrap it around my sure. wrist so I could drop it like that. And that I really like. The only problem is if I hold it up, that strap might come in behind the camera and get in the way of sure. the viewfinder, or it might come in front of the lens. And so I didn't want that. I wanted also, when you're carrying it around, I wanted to be able to just hold it by the handle itself. Yep. You know, yep. and not have this, you know, constricting blood in yeah, my yeah. wrist. Uh. So, so this was the beginning of it. And as Ed alluded to just a couple of moments ago, he, on the other hand, was taking it from the perspective of, can I hang that weight off my belt? And that's the value of a capture clip. And so we had different experiences of what worked best for each of us. And then the question was, how do you get something that is agnostic when it comes to personal taste or preference in a design? And this is where 3D modeling was brilliant. This is where 3D printing, Ed, maybe you want to talk about the fact that you have a 3D printer in your house. These were incredible. So we, we found we had this constant tension between a design vocabulary, which Leica is better at than anyone and has executed extraordinary stewardship of it, and the practical reality of being able to use the tool with as little futzing as possible. So, for example, again, the Q3 grip is wonderful. I don't care about Qi charging. But that grip with that base plate means you don't have access to the card slot or to the battery. Now, on the one hand, that's fine because you can use a USB port. But when you're out on the street, you don't want to carry a battery in your pocket, a cable, USB-C cable, and hook it in. You just want to pull out the battery and put in another one. And wait for right? it to charge. Yeah. Right. So that's that was one thing. Or what happens if you run out of a card? It's not like the Q3 has internal memory the way the M11 does. Or what happens if you actually try to use the Q3 grip that comes from the factory? Again, tremendous. I mean, the precision and quality of Leica stuff is extraordinary, but the way the grip is shaped, you can't hold it like this. If you let go, 
it drops. Yeah. And so we looked at every one of these things and we addressed them one by one, model after model. Ed, how many prototypes have we actually built? Uh, easily heading into the three digits. Three digits, huh? <laughs> And it's it's subtle. There there's you know, subtle changes of a millimeter here, a millimeter there, sure. add up. Uh, you know, there's there's uh, there's give and take, and there's repercussions and consequences of the one change and how it affects trickle down to other aspects of even the simplest designs. Um, so do you, you? So do you? You you've incorporated a few other things, and um, you know, having done my research. Uh, you've made it so it's obviously peak design clip available, but you also made it so you could put a peak uh, design lug on it, correct? It doesn't need a lug. That's actually one of the best things about it. So before, and this goes to my experiences I was having, even with the Q3 on Q's workshop, is that I like using the capture clip because before the Q3, I would I had actually made a some tools for serving as a third hand. So in sure. the field, I want to swap a lens. I use the peak capture clip as with a modified um, a base attachment in me so that I can actually have the capture clip hold the lens while I swap a new lens and then easily um, put it back without fumbling with just two hands. It acts as a temporary space, or I can put the camera there. So the, for me to use the uh, peak capture clip was actually... Uh, a, a, a necessity for me, even with the cube, because then I could, when I'm in the street, I actually carry two cameras. So I'll have the Q, which is my primary. And then as a backup, I had the X-T5 with an eight millimeter or a 75 millimeter, kind of captured the extreme ed edges outside of the range of the Q3. So I could have one at the hip at the ready or have the other camera ready and be able to swap back and forth quite easily, quickly as the scenes change and the opportunities change. Uh, but because of that, I tend to always have the camera in hand. But if you go a couple hours, you know, if you're you know, with 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 the with the Q body not having any discernible finger rests, you know, it's just basically the, right. It's a piece of metal. It's pretty heavy too. You I mean, squeeze it, and it's yeah. not necessarily light after a while. So yeah. you're actually it gets tiresome. So there's no way to just simply let it hang, relax, and be a comfortable. Uh, a comfort, comfortable ex extension of your of your hand, and be able to quickly bring it up to your eye when you need to, or not, or even to your waist. And so, some of the experiences with the uh, other camera systems tend to have you know the, the, the finger finger grips and thumb thumb locations, yep. uh, sometimes at the detriment of the the aesthetic of the design. But they're functional, versus the Q and the Leicas are very beautiful forms. But they're not always going to be uh, addressing the, the actual use over long periods of time. So, so when when you're putting this together, you made a base plate, you made room for it, and how did you decide? And I only ask this because I got a lot of grips. You know, I have camera bag shame, and I probably have grip shame right. also, um, because you know, over the years, you know, I've always bought a lot of auxiliary grips um, for not only the like as I had, but for you know some of the others and especially the fujis i have rosewood grips for my fuji xt5 and xh1 um, i've got a really nice uh, wooden grip uh for the uh the, the x106 um and I, I was lucky enough to get one of those on the first day um and you know it's one of those things that are with big hands you know how, how do you decide how small or how big you make that grip because that's part of the the comfort level i would think that makes it easier to use a heavier camera, you know, all day long and also to keep it steady, you know, especially with the thumb thing. So um, what was the evolution of that? How did you do that? Uh... Can I, <laughs> let, me, let, let me let me jump in yeah, for sure. a second. Just to say that that we we didn't think look, form follows function, right? So we didn't think in terms of exotic woods or anything else. As far as size is concerned, we thought we 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 have our sized hands, but what we were thinking about most of all was to ensure that the grip didn't get in the way of the natural function of the camera itself. Sure. So, for example, one of the things that's quite extraordinary and very different from anybody else 
is that we have a thumb rest, which is modular. You can have it or you cannot have it. But the thing about the way we engineered it is you still have the hot shoe free. And when we look at this, we go, you got to be kidding me. I mean, the thumb rest is a very popular thing. But guess what you can't do when you have a thumb rest? Yep. You can't use flash, right? So there was that. We went through innumerable, well, not innumerable, but we went through change after change after change to get a grip. Let me see if I can get that in there. There you go. A grip, which does perhaps violate some of the vocabulary, the design vocabulary of Leica, but which in point of fact fits beautifully and easily so that you can one hand it. And so that with this, even with the rest here it's we haven't gotten in the way of anything right yep. so we start with what is our end point and work backwards when it comes to the bottom let me just come in here for a second like this can you see it i see it so of course we've got arca swiss but the real innovation on this score is that we simultaneously do the capture clip compatibility ed was big on this and it was brilliant that he was so yeah so this, you know, this some people you use the belt thing, but this is the capture clip. Oh. And the way most people implement this is they have to put on the adapter plate on the bottom, which works with this. It comes with the clip, but then you start adding things onto it. So some people may have a group, may have a base plate already, but then if they want the capture clip, then they got to attach that to the base clip. And so you get this layering of different, you know, klutzy pieces that don't really work together and are hard to get into your bag. So but what we was able to do is just simply design the base, which is our, you know, just plain sm smooth base. It'll sit on the table, but it slips in. There you go. And the base is aluminum, correct? Yeah. Base the whole thing is aluminum. But that this is thing. one thing that's, a, that's important. This particular design is much more sophisticated than a base plate and a grip. And I've sworn Ed to secrecy. We, we, you know, pinky blood brothers with this. We don't want to reveal exactly what the internal structure of this is, but this entire thing is skeletally one piece. The machining of this is extremely complicated and we are really, I don't like to use the word proud, but yeah, we're jazzed. We're jazzed that, that we've created something which no one else has done. No one else has done. Uh, I want to return just to a second for a second to the the question about the lug, because what we did is we take advantage of the lugs that are already there. But let me see if I can get this in. There you go. Yeah. We've put in our own lug at the bottom, which at, makes it easy to put in, easy to put in a, uh, a Peak Design anchor. And now all of a sudden I've got exactly what I want. Yeah, I like that setup. I use that uh, with my 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 X100. Uh, but but here's here's the thing. Where's the lug from the factory? Here. Yep. Right? Yep. If I were to put this grip, if I were to try to put an anchor up here, first of all, I haven't figured out even with using dental floss how to pull it through, but I'm sure someone has. But now it's up here. And now it gets in the way of your hand when you've got it down here you don't That's and cool. this level of this level of thinking and i'm going to stop talking again so ed please take over oh, no. but it it's it was just it's yeah. so much fun yeah you're it's having so you're fun. having too much fun with this man the so, fun part was burying the the uh, air tag into the grip and you wouldn't ever know it i mean this thing is the base plate itself is very thin, but we were able to incorporate it completely into the grip itself. You just rotate it three-dimensionally just the right way. And it's, you know, fits in cool. a very innocuous form. Is the uh, grip made, made of rubber or what? what it's what's aluminum. It? Aluminum? Do they have anything that's non-slip? I mean, is it slippery? It, or? It, we have a finger groove on the inside, which capture, allows it to be natural, uh, just to easily yeah. and naturally just hang. And so there's very subtle aspects to it that uh, become more evident once you use it. Um, we also added the, the, incorporated the connection point for the finger loop 
uh, that Leica sells. The Leica three finger group, or if you yeah. put your fingers and in it. It's funny because I, I only was, get two in. Yeah, I know. It's really... Yeah, I do. I do too. And you know, I, I was a little hesitant about its value as a, an accessory, but ever since I we we decided to put that anchor point on there and get it to experiment with it, I actually like it. Uh, and now but this I, is this is another thing that's so interesting because. We originally uh, modeled the uh, connection point, the screw for the finger loop, so that it was absolutely in line with what we'd seen like it do. But again, once you actually have it in hand and start to use it, depending on where you're holding it, the weight on your fingers, the pressure changes. And so what we ended up doing is modeling and modeling and modeling, and Ed was able to relocate where the screw hole is and then do it within this, Steve Jobs said the things about uh, simple is that simple is hard, right? Yeah. We take something complex and make it simple. But that's one of the things that we really get yep. jazzed about as well, yep. because it isn't like we do one thing and then include something on top and then include something on top. Maybe at the beginning we do, but between the two of us, we said, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. And Ed has this incredible facility for modeling and, and thinking in three-dimensional space. And then we both have very sensitive hands. So we would have it <laughs> in real life and play with it. And we got to this better point where we feel that where the finger loop attachment is now is better than what it was before. Excellent. It sounds like a, a really wonderful product. Um, like, when do you expect this product uh, to come out? You've, you've, you are you to the point now where you know how you're going to model the the final, the final version? Already done. Okay, so we're so we can buy these tomorrow. So, Kevin, because you and I go back a long way, you're one of only a couple of outlets that we we're sitting and talking with ahead of this. But if you post this this Friday, because we're doing it ahead of our uh, announcement that we are taking pre-orders, uh, as soon as people see this video, and let's call it 11 a.m. this Friday, uh, they can order it. They can pre-order it. So, and is there a pre-order special or what's the pricing point on this and how you're doing it? So this is really important. We, it's not just about the product. I mean, the whole notion of business is interesting. And what happens on YouTube is too often people are quick to criticize uh, camera companies, lens manufacturers, and I'm not above criticizing, but I do it with an appreciation and respect for how much it takes to design a product, to make choices about what one includes, what one doesn't include, what the trade-off is in terms of margin or producibility, manufacturability with an Edwards Deming uh, kind of approach to quality so that you're designing it into the process. What we also wanted to do was to build it, manufacture it, if we could, in the United States. Not because we're wrapping ourselves in the American flag, but because Yay! we think that. <laughs> That's but good, good financial ecosystems, just yep. generally speaking, financial ecosystems begin at home. Good. And so we wanted to, to do this in the United States. And in fact, Ed, I, I really want you please to talk and, and tell Ed about, uh, tell Kevin about the kinds of companies that we're using. But we did a survey and we found that people were willing to pay a premium. They understood what we were trying to do. It's not just the product, it's how we conduct ourselves as a company, right? Yeah. I and think so, so we, we found that they were willing to pay a higher amount if it were manufactured close to home. And what we did is we looked at all of the other grips that are out there, the $50 grips, the Leica factory grips, all of the companies, the usual suspects that you would imagine. And then we looked at what we were actually offering, how we were actually offering it. And we figured that, for example, if we'd gone to Kickstarter or Indiegogo, the amount that we would have to discount meant that the amount that we would have to charge later would be untenable. We really thought that we might have to go offshore, 
but eventually we were able to find again, and, and I give full credit to Ed for this, finding partners that could work with us. And we decided that we weren't going to go to retailers either because Kevin, you know what the margins are that retailers are asking for. Yeah, yeah. And we would not have been able to give the price that we're able to do now by selling direct. So we're taking a different set of risks. We're taking a, a different set of workload onto ourselves uh, rather than leaving it to a Kickstarter or a retailer. And we have so you, great relationships yeah. with retailers. So it's 480 bucks. Uh, and for 480 bucks, they're getting the AirTag compatibility, Arca Swiss compatibility, which by the way, the Leica Q3 factory grip doesn't have. No. Uh, peak design, capture clip compatibility, mm -hmm. multiple lug locations. In fact, you can structure this for carry the way the Leica M5 and the original Leica Film CL uh, are done also. Mm -hmm. uh, we use anti-tamper uh, screws. We've engineered it, and again, all credit to Ed, so that there are no external screws connecting the grip to the base plate. So you can't just remove them and then take out the air tag. If you want to get rid of the air tag, you're going to break the camera or you're going to break the grip. It's like that. So do you Which put doesn't... the air... yeah, you put the air tag in as part of the product or no. No, so we buy... we they they supply their own air tag. Okay. There is a, a there's going to be a beautiful little pamphlet on how to install the air tag. We don't want to put that up on YouTube uh because we don't want someone to just, you know, see exactly sure. how it's done. Uh and yeah. So it's 480 bucks exclusive of the AirTag, exclusive of shipping taxes. We've got a number of inquiries from overseas. And what we've said basically to ourselves is we'll ship it anywhere DHL or Federal Express does, but shipping, VAT, all the rest of that, uh, that's exclusive of the $480. And that is absolutely the tightest <laughs> price that we could do and decide yeah. that that it's feasible because we were going to walk away from it if it weren't feasible. So you and Claudia are going to have a garage full of, of things that you're going to fulfill from, huh? Like the new Amazon, man. Can you imagine Brownstone's going to have like trucks in another, another 20 years and he'll be actually, fulfilling. Ed, do you want to, do you want to take that on? Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I got garage space. I got a big house, big house yeah. and empty nester now. So I got extra rooms. That's good. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But I think there are some things to consider. Maybe I think a lot of times it's hard for some to appreciate how what appears to be simplicity is a end result of tremendous complexity. So you know, we always I always point this out is that you know, talking about Apple and you look at your iPhone or any Android button app for that matter, you know, they they take on the Deceptive simplicity of the uh, obelisk in 2001. Mm -hmm. Thinking about the movie, nothing more than a rectangular floating black shape with no impression on it. And yet it represents the enormity of intelligence and Latin, um, expression of things beyond our, our comprehension. And so when we look at making something simple, as Apple, Apple as a company may do with some of its products, there's an enormous amount of complexity that lies underneath that tip of the iceberg that represents cost, represents a lot of time and, and yep. effort. So for instance, what we what you'll uh, what maybe see is that it, manufacturing this costs money for a number of reasons. One, it's low volume. You, you know, you... you you can lower price of things by going through, you know, mass production. Uh, we're 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 not talking about that scale. Uh, you're talking about a high complexity design. We're, we're utilizing minimally three, but mo mainly four and five axis CNC machinery in order to create some of these shapes. And the reason we got to that point is going back to that deceptively simple thing is that in our iterations of the design, we went from what was a multitude of parts to make this up to essentially three parts. And to do that, has to manufacture an element in three dimensions out of a solid piece of aluminum, because over time, you know, this gets used and abused. If things are screwed together, bolted together, 
you get into drift, you get into looseness, things start separating, things get wobbly. This is carved out of a single part to maintain the precision accuracy in its relationship to the camera. Oh, so as a testament to Leica's design, we looked to keep to that same precision just for the fact that we want it to be as durable and as bulletproof as the camera itself. Sure, sure. I mean, Leica does similar with that whole design from a solid piece of aluminum on, on a number of their products. So it sounds like a pretty exciting product, uh, to say the least. Where do you see it going in the future? What, what if you're going to? Do you have a roadmap for adapting it to other cameras, or what's what's the future plans? Fun. We we <laughs> come on. We got to know. We got to know. We hint, do. Hint. Okay. We, we do well, have we a road do. plan, but not not only do we have a road plan but we actually have several other versions in the queue. Let's not talk more about that right at the moment, because first we have to see how we do sure, this sure. first time out. Um, but you're but thinking, it, of the, you're thinking. We're thinking so hard. I can smell Ed's brain smoking across <laughs> the phone call. It's hard and, to my lips. Yeah, yeah. okay. And, 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 and we both have cameras, other cameras that we've reached the point. This is absolutely true. You'll appreciate this, Kevin. We've reached the point where it's not on our other cameras. And because the whole mission really of Helium Design Lab is a more perfect union between photographer and gear, uh, we I want this for my M11. He wants it for his X-T5. Everybody wants it for the Q2. I mean... There's a ZF, Nikon. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff out there, but we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. No, no, it's one no, that's thing a, I understand. to model good, it, good wise but it's another thing to say, do we? can we actually bring it to market? And I, I just want to add that when Ed and I talk about making the complex simple and having unique solutions to particular design challenges, because we don't see them as problems, we see yeah. them as challenges. This is the basis for the patent that we have pending. Good, as you should, as you should. I think the, the most notable compliment I think you gave me was that when he was using it and had to take it off because we were, we were transitioning to some other designs, he, he missed having it on. And I think what I think is a success is that it feels natural with it and it feels unnatural without it. And it really does feel that way. Not, not to kind of pat ourselves on the back, but whenever I take it off for whatever reason, it just feels awkward not to have it on the camera. Yeah. Oh I, God. I, I, what, I, I, what if, I, what if the problem is that, that Ed, you and I are the only ones who are going to be this happy. <laughs> yeah, never know. Wow. Because we designed it for us. We designed we it for you, but you know the fact that you're designing it for you and you've got the same uh, DNA as most of us that own cameras have, I think you'll find it to be uh, acceptable and uh, people get excited about it. Huh? I'm, I'm excited about it. I forgot the problem is I got to go buy a Q3 so I can use it. <laughs> we don't worry, I have access to one if I need it, so... Um, good. Yeah, it's uh, it sounds like quite the cool project, and I, I think you've got a, a bright future ahead, both of you. Um, I can I can think of other products that would be fun to uh, adapt and move along. So I mean, this you know you've got a lot of growability not only in the the product line because you've got a lot of cameras that you can fulfill with this product, but I think you know with the kind of design that's, that you do and you know some of the other challenges that we face as photographers um you know that you, you some of the design solutions that would be fun to, to implement would be fun to see done um we can talk privately about that sometime but sure. and i think when you Absolutely. figure out how to, how to make one of these for the helium grips for the the iphone <laughs> and that's there are the numbers that you need for scalability <laughs> well to be fair it's it's not like like it isn't thinking along those lines itself and and we love the company we love the people at the company uh, you know how high we hold them in regard. Yep, yep. So our our objective is to do what we do where we see an opportunity to do it better than anybody else. Well, I think that's the thing you've got to do. You know, I'm I'm watching Apple with some of the new things that they're putting in their OS. And, you know, there's companies out there that were those solutions. And all of a sudden, 
you know, once Apple puts them in there, you know, those solutions basically go away or they make them, they have to make them better or do something different. So, um, you know, you always face those risks, but I think the, you know, the, the number of models and products out there that could use a, uh, a, a grip like this are, are quite good. And, you know, there's guys selling these handles on Etsy that, you know, I, the ones I bought my Rosewood handle from actually looks pretty cool and it actually feels yeah. very nice. You know, they're not cheap either. So it's not a matter of the price. You know, people like us that can buy a camera will will buy a grip. And it's like software for printing. People have $10,000 of camera gear and, and they won't buy a $500 piece of software that makes printing easy. Right. So, you know, I, it, I think it's all relative. And, you know, sometimes it has to come around the, the, the other way. But if, you know, you can enjoy taking pictures and making pictures and you find a product like this, that can, that can make it easier and, and more comfortable and specifically, I think, more fun because of the way you can, you know, hold it and, and accomplish what you need to do without a lot of futzing, that, uh, you know, you're on to the right thing. I can't wait to see the product. Well, thanks, Kevin. So, Ed, you know, my, my hat is off to you. I, I, I don't know you other than what we've just done, but I'd, I, I hope somewhere along the line uh, our paths cross and... Um, so you know, look at some of the other work that you've done. I, I, I did get on the sites, your other site. So I saw that. Uh, so it's, you're, you're definitely paired up with the right team here. So my hat is off to you and uh, look forward to seeing how the package looks, how you package it itself, what the OBE is all like. And you know, of course, I think, you know, once you got a number of people shooting with this on their, their Q system, um, you know, you're, you're going to find people get hooked to it. Um, I am really surprised at how much the the, the like a Q3 is uh, gaining a following. Um, it's it's a it's a damn nice camera system, and I got people that have talked to me and said, ah, you know, I got rid of my Fujis and everything, and I just shoot with the the Leica now, and it's a beautiful camera, and, and they've done the menu right and a lot of other things right, which Leica always has a a way of doing. Not to mention the optics are so incredible, so. Um, it's funny. It was just, you know, my hat's off to you and Hugh, good ideas. Um, kind of funny how people's paths cross uh, and the two of you were able to get together to, to brainstorm a solution for something that photographers face and, you know, the way they photograph. So, um, well, Kevin, thank you for taking the time to sit down with us. So um, it's, it's good. So let's, let's get moving on it. Um, and I appreciate the, the time you gave me today and <laughs> I just want to see the product. I want to see it work. So, um, <laughs> well, you so for you and for anyone else who watches this, uh, our website is heliumlab.design, no.com. And again, if this comes out when we think it's going to come out, as soon as <laughs> they see this, they'll be able to order it there. Cool. Ed and Hugh, thank you for, for spending time with me this afternoon. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm very excited to, to see uh, a new product, uh, especially ones developed by uh, friends that uh, I know and uh, know what their passion is in regards to photography and uh, developing a solution that would be good for those people using the camera systems. Um, so my hat's off to you and uh, can't wait to, to see it. So thanks once again. This thank Kevin. you, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks. So everybody, I want to thank you very much. It's Kevin Raber for Photo PXL, and we'll see you again real soon.